still okay we're recording uh, so good afternoon everybody and welcome to the second in our local author in interviews today we are very very lucky to have mark scott with us he's a, an author from horwich who has come along to tell us all about his book beyond the witch's circle and some of the background to the book where he came up um, how he came up with his ideas. Um, I do know that Mark is, is really passionate about, about this novel and um, this, this should appeal to people who are, who are book lovers and also people who are very interested in family history as well. So thank you, Mark, for coming along. Uh, we really thank you do for appreciate, me. appreciate it. Yeah, it's fantastic of you to give your time this afternoon. Um, so just before you start, would you like to give people perhaps a little bit of information about yourself, a bit of background to you? Well, what can I say? Yeah, um, I'm a retired uh, university academic manager. I used to, used to work at uh, uh, Blackburn University Centre and prior to that for 30 years nearly, I worked at the University of Bolton. Um, so we lived in Bolton for quite a few years and I'm not a historian or anything similar by background. I'm actually a physicist. But I'm retired now. I'm making mischief of myself. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a member of Bolton Mountain Rescue Team, which keeps me busy. Yes, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, oh, that's fantastic. So you've got a lot, you've got a lot on. You, so you're a very busy man. We're very lucky to have you this afternoon. Did you hear that? That, 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 was, <laughs> that was the call-out message. I better turn that off. <laughs> Fortunately, so, they know I'm not available. Yes, so so I can, I can, uh, I can explain how it was that I came to be the writer of this historical novel and that's what the lecture's about really. Yes because I was going to I was just going to mention that you were doing I don't want to give the game away but you were doing a bit of family research weren't you when you came across I was this, yeah. It's amazing yeah. very intriguing mystery which formed the background to your novel. That's right. Yeah well I don't want to spoil give any spoilers so I shall hand over to you and look forward to hearing all about it this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you and thanks again for inviting me. Oh, here we go. Um, it's a bit of a surprise, really, that I ever got to be writing the book, which is this book here, Beyond the Witch's Circle. Uh, I've always felt that there was a book inside me uh, that wanted to get out, but couldn't find a title. And then I was doing a bit of fairly ordinary family history research, and, and this amazing story just hit me square between the eyes when I discovered a link between my poor farming and mining family living up in Geordie land um, and one of history's most famous women Josephine Elizabeth Butler uh, so what became it went from being you know ordinary to extraordinary and I realized that uh, hey I've got to write I've got to write a, a you know a book about this so I'll try and give you some idea of how this happened I'll start off if this works by showing a little video uh, as a backdrop to me reading an abridged version of the first chapter of, of the okay. book. Um, uh, so the video should play in the background while I'm reading it. We'll see how it goes. Fantastic. I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll be wonderful. There's the video, hopefully. I've tried to make it look yeah. like it was taken in Victorian times. It, um, it looks fantastic, actually. It looks really good. By adding you know, a, few, a few effects. Yeah. So this is reading from chapter one of Beyond the Witcher's Circle. Just turn the music sound down a bit. A woman stood alone on ancient Corbridge Bridge in the dark quiet of early Sunday morning, both her hands on the cold stone parapet. She was looking vacantly at the river below. It was five o'clock. She'd been in the vicinity since just after midnight, all night. It was the 19th of October, 1856. This was to be her last day. She returned for the third time in as many hours to the spot where the water below seemed deepest. Twice before, she had retreated from this place. She knew that to take her own life was a sin. How much greater would be her sin if she jumped with a baby inside her? What else was there for the two of them? Once again, she climbed onto the parapet and allowed her legs to dangle over the drop. She looked down once again at the black water below. Recent rains had swelled the river 
so that it was in spades, flowing deep and strong and churning menacingly. It was blacker than anything she'd ever seen before, and yet it was marbled through with silver veins forever moving, chasing here and there a sparkling vision of sinister and deadly beauty formed by the reflection of the bright young crescent moon on the time's chaotic current. All she had to do was shift her weight forward just a little, a few inches, and it would be done. Then her thoughts, turning like the water she faced, returned to the thing that had brought her here in the first place. The innocent within her and the appalling prospect of it losing all of its chances, its whole future, at a stroke of her utter selfishness. She did not shift her weight forward. Instead, she looked at the sky to the east. It was starting to lighten. Birds had started to sing. A new day, a Sunday, was dawning. Let it be a new day for her and for her baby. This answer was not today. That's the, that's the beginning of the uh, the chapter in which uh, Jane Scott is in a desperate situation and it's about finding out what happened to her. Now this photograph that you see here is uh, on the right is my great grandfather Walter Scott. Um, yeah. You bit to be there compared to his brother Ernest who's a little bit younger than he is and they're, they're from Bladen in the northeast uh, which is near which is very close to Newcastle, right up against the River Tyne up there. And he's, uh, he's ready, they're both ready to go, they're both ready to go to, to war. Unfortunately, Ernest, uh, the younger one, he was killed in Flanders Fields near Ypres on the 15th of May, 1915. Oh. Um, and he's buried in the, in the war graves at Boulogne-sur-Mer. Yeah. He was oh. killed right alongside Walter. Walter unfortunately saw his brother blown to pieces uh, and that affected him for the rest of his life. Yeah. I know this because I spoke to his, uh, Walter's, um, uh, Walter's daughter, my great aunt Marion, who died recently, age 104, which is pretty good going. And she was amazing, one of my favorite people. Yeah. Yeah. This is the medal that uh, Walter came back with, you got the, the standard war medals, the, the first three on the, on the left. The one on the right, can you see my pointer moving? Yes. Yeah, yeah. that one there is the Belgian Croix de Guerre, the war, of, uh, the war medal, the uh, military cross. And he got that for uh, bravery in the field, an act of uh, individual bravery, an act of individual feats of arms. So that was quite unusual and he was mentioned in dispatches. So, he did all right for himself, although he lost his brother in that conflict. Yeah. When he came back from the war, he was living in Bishop Auckland and he, he started working in this factory as the general manager of this factory. Now, this is the uh, Shaw, Shaw and Knight factory in Bishop Auckland up there in Geordieland. And um, he was the general manager. The factory made, well, the polite way of saying it is sanitary earthenware by which we usually mean basins, baths, but also urinals. <laughs> so there's definitely a, a urinal connection in our family. Um, the, the characters bottom right are William uh, Henry Knight and Andrew Shaw, who actually own the factory that makes these uh, sinks and baths and basins and urinals. And um, it turns out that Walter is the uh, nephew of Andrew Shaw. So it's a bit of keep it in the family. When Walter came back from the war, he probably went to Andrew Shaw and said, you know this factory you've got in Bishop Auckland, how about me working there? And clearly they did, he did. So he gave him a job there. This is the, the stuff they made, uh, the sinks there. And uh, yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of new rhinos. <laughs> um, just to, to show the kind of the, the wares. <laughs> That they had and here they're making baths um, this shows the baths in 1929 now then 
1922, there were 26 shillings, seven, uh, 27 pounds, 17 shillings and sixpence for the one that you can see in the foreground, yeah. which is an A quality model. If you go on the uh, Bank of England website, you, you, you'll find there's a calculator to work out what that's worth in, re in pleasant day money, uh, taking into account inflation. And in that's fact, it works out at £1,285. <laughs> yeah. They over £1,000. Enormous facts, aren't they? Yeah. I'm not surprised, <laughs> you know, with the weight of it, but it, it was, yeah. you know, £1,200 for that bag. Mm. So it wasn't a cheap item. And here, you know, there's nothing like getting your arm right down the new bend. This is actually in the fact. This is actually in the factory of Bishop Auckland, that, where my uh, great granddad was in charge. An interesting side story to this is that once Walter became the general manager, he employed his own son Jim, who was my granddad, to work as a sort of a foreman, uh, and he was terrible. The, the men were up in arms against my my granddad Jim, uh, and in the end, Walter had to sack his own son. <laughs> his son was so miffed at the fact that his, his own father had sacked him from his mm -hmm. job that he, his wife, and his children, including my dad, all went off to Coventry. And they rather bad choice of timing because just as they arrived in Coventry, the Blitz on Coventry began and they were there for the, for the middle of the Blitz. And that, uh, that story is part of the story that uh, is, is dealt with in this book here, The King Cried for Coventry, which the story itself precedes Beyond the Witcher Circle, although it was actually published afterwards. Um, also, interestingly, when, when they realised that Coventry wasn't a very good place to be because of all the bombs coming down and people getting killed, they decided to go back to the northeast. Instead of going to Bishop Auckland, they went to Whitley, Whitley Bay, or as they call it up there, Whitley Beer. And uh, just as they arrived in Whitley Bay, the Whitley Bay bombings began. I kid you not. <laughs> that's, so terrible. Left... that's terrible timing. <laughs> it is terrible timing, yeah. So that's a, a little backstory anyway. Yeah. Um, this just shows you the, the relationships. There's, there's, uh, there's Walter. Whoops, go back. There's Walter, my great granddad, the one who got the medal and who's mm. lost his brother. His dad was Henry Scott and his mum was Elizabeth Jane Balance before she got married. And there is Andrew Shaw, who married Elizabeth's sister, Isabella. So that's how Walter is a nephew of Andrew Shaw. That shows the, the relationship there. But it also shows that Walter's dad was Henry Scott, uh, who married Elizabeth Jane Balance. Elizabeth Jane Balance was seven years younger than Henry. This is... Um, a coal mine is called the Lily Drift Mine, and you've got 13 inches from top to bottom to have to crawl through to get the coal and also the fire clay that they get out of the mine in Bishop Auckland. And the reason this is important because that's why the factory exists because in order to make urinals yeah. and sinks and basins, yeah. you need two things you need coal for the furnaces, but you also need clay. And this mine is a horizontal seam of coal and fire clay, 13 inches high, with a bit of fire clay on top that goes into the hillside in Bishop Auckland. Yeah. And it's because that exists and the terrible conditions that they had to mine in it, that's the reason that the factory exists. Yeah. Use the materials. Now, thinking about Horwich in Bolton, can you think of anywhere in our area where coal and fire clay uh, exist in a seam going into a, a hillside. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some over on Burnt Edge somewhere. Like that. Burnt Edge, that's yeah. a very good answer. In fact, Is it? Yeah, oh. if you look up above Horwich, there are uh, yeah. old mine workings yes, and they yes. go into towards Burnt Edge and up towards Winter Hill. Mm. And in fact, there is a seam in Horwich, which is a, meet, well, a, a yard high, they called it then, uh, a yard high with a certain amount of fire clay sitting on top of it and it starts just above where I live and goes into the hillside near Wilderswood, oh. um, George, George's Lane around yes, there yeah. and goes yeah. in under Winter Hill 
And that was mined back in Victorian times. Right. So guess what we had in Horwich mm -hmm. in those days? Well, we had the pipe works that I'm, my house sits on now, as I'm speaking to you now, oh, from, the, from, from up the hill in Horwich. Uh, they used to make pipes in what they used to call the Klondike. And you, in order to make pipes, in earthenware pipes, you need coal and clay. Mm. Mm. But also, there's a bit more to it than that. If I look at this census record, this I decided to look into the owner of the factory in Bishop Auckland, find out some more about him. His name was Andrew Shaw. He was the uncle of my great grandfather, as we mentioned. So here's the uh, a record from the census, 1911 census. And we, we home in it on a bit more closely. You can see Andrew Shaw with his wife, Isabella, who was, as I mentioned before, the sister of Elizabeth. And there's the children, Richie Shaw and so on. And it's all pretty much as you would expect. He's being described as working in um, uh, sanitary fire yeah. clay works and so on. Yeah, everything is as you would expect. Now be prepared for a shock because when you look at the bottom of that sheet. I'll have to come a bit closer, sorry. <laughs> When you look at the oh, bottom of that you. sheet, you, you see this. Andrew Shaw. Oh, yes. yes. 224 Group Lee Lane, Horwich. Mm. I nearly fell off the yeah, chair when I saw this. Thing. Good grief. This is, you know, I mean, that's just the bottom of my road. I go past it every day. Lee Lane, Horwich. Why is this? Yeah. Well, this is so where, 224 where is Lee that? Lane, Horwich. I was going to say, where is that in Lee? Oh, well, right. Just to the right, just to the right mm. is the crown, the pub. Yeah. Called the crown at the bottom of crown lane okay. so it's right you can see the car park of, of the crown yes. there yeah and there's my car there can you see with the mountain rescue sticker yeah <laughs> so my great granddad's uncle who owned this factory he lived there what was he doing there living there and also it said he was do, he was doing sanitary in Amalware in horwich well here it is it was the pickup factory in horwich here it is. It was behind what we now have this Aldi, the, the supermarket. It was a it was a, an enamel sanitary wear factory that made, yep, you mm. guessed it, basins, baths, yeah. uh, and urinals and so on. Uh, and look at the phone number at the top. Can you see it? Horwich, two. Oh yes, yeah. That's it. <laughs> That is the number. I'm looking for a number there. <laughs> Have you ever seen a phone number that's just one number? You see, the thing is, people in Norwich, they have trouble remembering numbers. But <laughs> sorry, like sorry, people in Norwich, not true. I'm only kidding. So uh, there you go, the shortest number. And, and they make, you know, um, the same sort of stuff. So yeah. what's going on here? Um, just, just skip that for a second. What must have happened is that uh, William... Henry Knight and Andrew Shaw must have learned their trade, as it were, as, as managers. They didn't own the factory in Norwich. They were managers. And they thought, well, we can do this for ourselves. And they got up to Bishop Auckland and set up their own factory because there's coal and there's fire clay in Bishop Auckland. So they got, went and did the same thing and decided to work for themselves, as it were, instead of working for Mr. W.R. Pickup Limited. Yeah. And that's how the connection between um, Horwich and uh, my, my uh, northeastern family occurs. So going back up to near Newcastle, just, just southwest of Newcastle is Bladen. There's the River Tyne. And you can see the A1 running up there, just mm -hmm. going by Bladen. That's what it looks like now on the Ordnance Survey map. This is what it looks like in the mid-19th mid century Victorian times. There is no A1, as you won't be surprised to hear. But there it is. You've got Bladen, the River Tyne, and to the southwest of Bladen, you've got Wynne Leighton, uh, which is up on the hill. You can see the way they represent the hill there. Wynne Leighton is indeed yeah. up on a hill above Bladen. And if you look carefully, just down here, there's, there's Wynne Leighton. There's a smithy there, which is where one of my ancestors used to work. And there's a little patch here just by the H of Hag Hill. Yeah. yeah. That, just to give the game away a little bit, that little patch of woodland there, that is the Witch's Circle. Oh, right. Of beyond the Witch's Circle Fantastic. fame. This is Bladen in the mid in the mid 19th century. Look how old that mm. locomotive is. Astonishing, beautiful, yeah. amazing yeah. photograph. 
one of the first ever photographs of its type that. So I started to look into, well, what about Walter's dad? And I found out that Walter's dad, Henry, Henry worked um, in the sort of 1880s and 90s in, you guessed it, sanitary fly, fly clay works. This time, not in Horwich, not in Bishop Auckland, but in yeah. Leyden, where we've just seen the map. Yeah. So talk about keeping it in the family. Mm -hmm. Henry was doing it before Walter ever did it. So this became, you know, a, a point of discovery and I decided to look into Henry, Henry Scott. Uh, there's, the, there's the Harriman's factory doing the same kind of things as they did in Norwich and in Bishop Auckland. Mm. And then I've just got that photograph in because I think it's lovely, 1903 it is with lovely. the horse and car. Yeah. It's a fantastic old photograph. Yeah. So I looked at the census for 18, this is the census for 1881 uh, and I'll be zooming in a second so don't worry but <laughs> on it you'll see <laughs> In, I'll zoom in a sec, but you could just about make out there, Henry Scott yes. and Anne Valens. And if I just zoom into that, you can see that Anne Valens was the head of the household, so she lost her husband. She's 73 years old and she's a widow. Uh, and then there's um, Henry Scott, and he's a boarder, so he's moved from somewhere. Yeah. And he's unmarried, 23-year-old, and he's got quite a good job, actually. He's a clerk to the railway, so that's pretty good. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's boarding and he's, he's got a job as a clerk to the railway. So he started to look a little bit further back. And this is the um, 1861 census. Let me just get my notes up to the same speed. The 61 census. Um, now, in this, you can make out that Henry is three years old, and this is his family. They're living in a place called uh, Shorewell House, yeah. and there's William. He's the head of the household, and Hannah, his wife. Then uh, there's these people here, Charlton, Hannah, Margaret. Uh, I can't even read that, Thomas. And then he is Henry, and he's grandson. So he's a grandson of William. Where's mum? That's odd. He's yeah. three years old. So he's born yeah. about 1858. And he's, you know, he's got no job because he's a child, mm. he's a baby. Mm. And he was born in Northumberland, Dilston. Dilston. Well, I'd never heard of Dilston. I don't know if you've yeah, ever heard of Dilston. No, no. No, I've never, I'd never heard of Dilston. Mm. No, so first, two things hit me in the face. First of all, Where's Dilston and why was he born there? And secondly, where's his mum and dad? Because they're not there. Mm. So I went to the 1871 census and I'll zoom in on that. I love these old, the old handwriting that you get. Mm. It, it takes a while to get your eye tuned on this old fashioned writing, but it, it does, you do get there gradually. And this is the uh, 1871 census. And, and so 10 years later, so. Henry would have been 13. Now. Yeah. And here's William and Hannah, the heads of the household. Every, all the other sort of young ones have moved on to their own jobs. But Margaret is still there. She's the daughter mm -hmm. of William and Hannah. And she's unmarried and she's uh, 23. And she's a, a, an agricultural labour. And then Henry, grandson still, no mum, no dad. He's 13. He's at school. Mm -hmm. And he's born in Corbridge, which is where Dilston is. Yeah. So where's mum? Where's dad? Because yeah. these, this mum and dad of Henry, these are my ancestors. I need to know where they are. The first thing was, where is this Shawwell house where Margaret and a lot, a lot of them are all agricultural labourers? Well, it's near the um, the Roman uh, Adrian's Wall. Oh. It's just south of Adrian's Wall, between the yeah. River Tyne and Adrian's Wall. The... Uh, the road runs up there and Shawwell House is a farm there. And next to Shawwell House, which, which was a farm, it's now a business centre, is Stagshaw Parson, Parsonage. It's still there, Stagshaw Parsonage, as is Shawwell House. And I've visited these places and uh, Stagshaw Parsonage and Shawwell House both play an important part in my book. Right. This is Shawwell House. I visited it to find out, oh, you know, as part of my search. Yeah. 
a nice place. And the guy, the guy who owns it came out and said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I hope you don't mind. Uh, I'm doing some research for my family tree. And uh, one of my ancestors was born in this house. Oh, he said, that's interesting. Come in. <laughs> so, so he took me into this. And I can't tell you how, how moving it was to be in the actual house yeah. where my great grandfather was brought up from the age of about one mm. up until, you know, he left for Bladen. And when he was 20, whatever it was, um, it was a really strange feeling that came across me as he showed me all the rooms, every single room in this wonderful old house. And there's the parsonage that you saw on the map. Yeah, there it the is, yeah. uh, which plays an important part in the book. And, and so, was, it, was it modern inside or did, was it still quite... Uh, yes and no. They, they done it, they'd done it very tastefully, actually. So um, it looked like an old farmhouse, but it wasn't yeah. falling to bits. It was, yeah. the plastic was in very good condition. Mm -hmm. And it was also comfortable and warm with a lovely, you know, wood fire and everything. I, I wanted to live there, actually. It was a really nice guy. And he said, as soon as, you, as soon as you bring that book, you've got to send me a copy. So I did. Yes, yeah. So I, I, I thought, well, you know, um, who, uh, when was, why was Henry born, you know, in Dilston, wherever that was, and then ends up when he's three, living in that farm. I managed to, eventually managed to track down his birth certificate, and here it shows some key things. Uh, he was born in 1867. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, sorry, 57. He's a boy, obviously. Oh, this is interesting. Lot. Father. Uh -uh. Yeah. And father. Well, that wasn't so unusual in those days. Mm. The other interesting thing is, mum signed with a cross, yeah, so she's illiterate. Like yeah. She's illiterate, and also her name is Jane Scott. I'd never heard of a Jane Scott. There's no mm. Jane Scott at Shawwell House Farm. There's no Jane Scott anywhere. Who is this yeah. Jane Scott? Yeah. So mystery was getting a bit intriguing. That zooms in on the same thing, uh, and you can mm. see there's no there's no dad. And yeah. uh, there's Jane Scott. And the uh, the registrar was James Fairlam. Mm. And it was registered in Hexham. So in my book, there's a scene in which a vicar uh, who's acting on behalf of Henry meets James Fairlam and they have a glass of whiskey together as, as James goes through his records to find oh. this very this very document. Yeah. So I, I, I kept the story very, very accurate historically. Now, I then sort of think, well, you know, where's Dilston? And it turns out to be just on the other side of the River Tyne. You go up a hill and there's a castle. In fact, all there is is the castle, a little farm, mm. which, is, which is an important spot in the book, and Dilston Hall. Uh, and the only place really... He could have been living, I later discovered, was Dilston Hall. Yeah. So he was almost certainly born, Henry, in Dilston Hall, mm -hmm. which is a very strange thing because Dilston Hall is a flipping mansion. Yeah. I was thinking that now you've obviously got, you know, some people <coughs> well, well off. You know. Yeah, but think about it. Unless, Jane unless was an he... illiterate, yes. unmarried mother. Exactly. From Corbridge. Yeah. And, and Henry had... Her son, oh, dad, yeah, was, yeah, and no dad, and was born in what is in effect a mansion. Yeah, so it doesn't make you know, look sense, at it. does it? Yeah. Um, this this is it in their wartime, mm. first world wartime, um, and I even got hold of, the, of a, a map of the layout of the of the rooms. You know, so it's like you know, it's like Cluedo, isn't it? Drawing room, just going to say it. Is it Cluedo? <laughs> <laughs> the library. You know, room? <laughs> all you need is some lead, some lead piping, and you do. And what yeah. else they use in that game? You know, you, you've got the whole game. And of course, yeah. I use this map in the book when I was describing the goings on. Uh, I won't mm -hmm. go into any detail, but I used this map because it was perfect. You know, I could I could talk about the yeah. actual places and, and rooms and so on. So it's all very well. There's a building there, and it's obviously a posh building. And, and Henry was born there, but who else lived there? Which brought me to. John Gray. This is John Gray. What a fine looking man. And he is the cousin, it turns out, of Earl Gray. 
The Earl Grey. The Earl Grey <laughs> of, of tea fame. Earl Grey yeah. was the Prime Minister who, as well as being famous for liking a tea that's named after him, he also abolished slavery, which is you know, just a little thing. Um, so he's quite a character. Uh, yeah. And he was a, a Christian libertarian type chappy. And he brought up his children to be the same, free thinking, very, very devout Christian, but actually anti-establishment Christian. So they, they were actually a bit suspicious of the, the established church. They were more um, uh, like sort of, of, the, of the Methodist and, and similar unorthodox uh, persuasion. Yeah. And he's a fascinating character. And this is his daughter, uh, Joseph, she was born Josephine Elizabeth Gray. Uh, she married Reverend George Butler, I discovered, who, who was um, um, from Oxford. And she turns out to be one of history's most famous women. So, ah, now what's going on here? And by the way, the T-shirt I'm wearing, that's her. Yes, there she this is, is her, yeah. Josephine yeah. Elizabeth Butler. So she, you can guess she's quite important. Yeah. So I started to read about uh, John Gray, her father, and Josephine Elizabeth Butler, who was born Josephine Elizabeth Gray. And I, I devoured anything I could because I, mm. I just felt there must be a link between her and my, my Henry, my, my, uh, my ancestor. Here's another picture of Josephine. She was, according to a newspaper article at the time, she was considered one of the most beautiful women yeah. in, in existence at the time. She was, you know, she was revered amongst the high and mighty. She was very aristocratic, as was her father. Mm. They were very well to do, as you can imagine, being cousin of the yeah. prime minister. Yeah. And here's, uh, I went to the Liverpool Museum, and here's uh, a bust of her. Uh, yeah. In there, she's actually yeah. on show there in, in the museum. That's amazing. So, yeah. the, the thing that made it all possible to actually research her was, was because she's so famous. Yeah. There's a lot of information. In particular, yeah. she wrote yeah. this book. She wrote this book about her father, and it's a proper book, and it's available uh, online for free. It is published in 1874, as you can see. So it's her talking all about her father. So you learn a lot about her father. And I portray her father in the book very accurately, therefore, because I've got all this information. Yeah. But also, because you, there's a lot of letters between her and her father in the book, you learn a lot about Josephine Elizabeth Butler as well. So yeah, that was a vital... How she, how she speaks as well. You know, exactly, that. yeah. Nice exactly, and the way she yeah. ticks, you know, her inner mm. thoughts. Yeah. I use, I use the, those in the book. Um, <coughs> she also wrote a book about, excuse me, her husband, George Butler, um, when he died, um, which, of course, contains even more personal letters and correspondence between her and George. That mm. gives you a, an even deeper insight into the nature of her as a person. Mm. So it was absolutely a goldmine, these books. Mm. And the more I read about Josephine Butler, the more I became overwhelmed by her, her as a person and absolutely towering towering character and if anybody's in any doubt of this now maybe you've never heard of Josephine Elizabeth no. Butler but she was voted recently the 19th most influential woman in the whole of human history wow uh, by BBC uh, where, by BBC say, history magazine where was oh, I was going to ask you where that was so yeah. it's, a, it's an, you know it's an authoritative source yeah. that it's not just on Mickey Mouse mm. thing. She, so a lot of people have not heard about it, but she, she was responsible for some huge social reforms. Uh, even when women had no power, she was able to wield power. And she took massive risks in pursuing all sorts of important causes, primarily about the rights of women and children. That's what she was about from the moment. Right. And that's okay. very important to my story. So she's a, she's a brilliant character. And mm. here she is. Uh, she's yeah. died now. Uh, this is 19, uh, about 11 or something. And um, this is her friends writing, uh, they call it an autobiographical memoir about her. Now she's died. And once again, a huge source of 
information. So in my book, when I write about Josephine Elizabeth Butler, I'm writing from from a firm foundation. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not short of information about what kind of person she is. Mm. And there's there's the book that I, I wrote, but I've still not explained how it is that she is linked to Henry because she's not no. Henry's mum. No. So how is it? Well, it turns out that Josephine Elizabeth Butler, from a, from a from an age of her early twenties, she was known for rescuing destitute women, okay. especially prostitutes. Yeah. That was her thing from an early age. She yeah. took them in. She gave them a job. Gave them jobs as servants. She was the only person daring to do that. People, some people said she was disgusting because she was, because she was, you know, mixing with these low life, as they saw it, low life women. But she said yeah. that God was, you know, wanting her to do this work because they were God's creatures and so on. Yeah. She was very devout Christian, uh, and so she rescued just destitute women, especially prostitutes. So that's the first clue as to what's going on. Yeah. yeah. I also started to look about the kind of social situation that occurred at the time. And there was a thing called the 1834 Poor Law Amendment Act. Now, I won't go into detail, but let me just say that if you were a, a, an unmarried woman and you, you were having a baby in those days, your plight was desperate. Because the, the prior to the 1834 Act, the parish was responsible under the Elizabethan Poor Laws the parish was responsible for looking after you, giving you an allowance. Uh, and so it really mattered which parish you were in. That's why they kept very detailed parish records because you were you were gonna, you know, nobody wanted to pay for a, a burdensome woman unless they yeah. absolutely had to. Yeah. So it was the Elizabethan poor laws that, that gave money to destitute women who had a child. And the, the, con the equivalent of conservatives at the time regarded this as a bad thing. Because they said it was it made poor law assistance almost as good as having a husband. You didn't need a husband. You just mm. had the baby <laughs> and then the state, what yeah. we now call the state, it was the parish, would give you this money and you're all sorted, thank you very much. Yeah. And they yeah. said they said it was encouraging bad behaviour amongst both men and women, that they wouldn't think of the consequences of, you know, um, mm. behaving badly. And so they decided... The government decided to bring in a new act which made women solely responsible not the parish but the women themselves responsible for the child and if they could find the husband then he also would be responsible but because in those days they had no dna tests all the husband had yeah. to say sorry all the man had to say not husband all the man had to say was they want me and who's to who's to argue against that because they've got no evidence there's no way of showing it. And so um, they decided that the woman would be responsible. Now, if you think about it, if you're a poor woman uh, and you're not married and you're having a baby, especially in the case of this, which turns out to be you're having a baby by a married man, then your family will throw you out. Yeah. Your employer will throw you out. Your only hope would be the workhouse, but many workhouses wouldn't take women who were in this particular circumstance because they thought it was too sinful. So your only hope was twofold. One, you could become a prostitute, or two, you could get rid of your baby. And there was a third possibility. And quite a, sorry, another possibility was you just kill yourself. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's I, why, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't thinking down those lines, but yeah, yeah. A lot did, you know, and that's why the, the beginning of the book. I, I, I read it to you about her, yeah. you know, standing on the bridge with a baby. She's got a baby inside her, and she's mm. she's agonising over what to do, because mm. that was the the plight faced by many women in those times. And another option I discovered uh, by by okay. reading newspapers and also reading books was something called baby farming. Now, very few people have heard of baby, baby farming, but what used to happen was they used to put adverts like this. This one is an actual advert from an actual newspaper of the time. 
and they used to put them in the newspapers that would be read by women, such as seamstresses uh, and housemaids. And it, it made it look like there was a way out. There's this, uh, this advertiser is a, a widow with a little family of her own, and she, she's got a little allowance from her husband, and she, she'd be prepared to accept a, a young child, um, you know, yeah. for, to adopt yeah. it if, uh, for 15 shillings a month. And also who would adopt it entirely if, if they're under two months old. And it sounds like this is a way out, except yeah. that 15 shillings is almost as much as you would earn yeah. at that time do, doing those jobs. So it sounds like, and many women believe that this was a way of, of you know, solving their problem. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take my baby to these, they didn't call themselves baby farmers, but we now call them that. And they will look after her or him, and then I'll be able to carry on doing a job of some kind, uh, and I'll learn as much as I can to pay for the, for the uh, childcare in effect. Except it wasn't that at all. That's not what it was about. This is Margaret Waters. She was a, a baby farmer and she's doing what they all did. She's murdering babies. Oh, they used to take in the babies and they used to maltreat them. And instead of feeding them milk, they would feed them with what's called quicklime, which is oh. what they used to make cement yeah. with. Mm. And it, it slowly mm. kills them. And if they cried, they'd give them something called laudanum, which we now mm. call morphine. Yeah and morphine would shut them up. And eventually they'd fade away, they'd register the birth and they would die. They would die and, reg and register the death. Um, sorry. In some cases they would simply kill them and like this woman here, uh, hide them away. And what they discovered was that not just in the Tyneside area, but all over the country, they were finding these little babies, bodies of little babies, wrapped in newspaper alongside each other and for a long time, they couldn't work out what's going on. They also found them floating in the river, in the River Tyne, in the Thames, in the Trent, bodies of babies floating. And they couldn't, they, first of all, they thought it was the women that were doing it. They were, they yeah, were disposing yeah. of their own babies. Mm. But when they discovered that babies wrapped in newspaper were, were found lying, different babies, from obviously from different families, were found lying in the same spot, they started mm. to get suspicious. And eventually they realised, and this book explains all about it, written in 1869, I won't go into details, but it's an absolutely brilliant book, explains it all. What was happening was these adverts were enticing women to give their babies away. They were taking the 15 shillings per, per, per month, and then they were taking the babies and killing them. And this was happening on an industrial scale for profit. Mm. Uh, there's, there's this old yeah. book you know, explaining about yeah. the background, and there's Baby Farming, Chapter 3. Mm. Fantastic book. Um, I can't believe that. Here's Amelia Dyer. She was a, a baby farmer, and she murdered babies for many, many years, up until 1896. If you think about who is Britain's most prolific serial killer, who would mm. you say? Yeah. Um. One of the Fred West, or, or I suppose the other one, um, what's it called? The, the child, Harold. <laughs> yeah, Harold Shipman, yeah. Harold Shipman, yeah. yeah. Harold Shipman, you know, is regarded as Britain's most prolific serial killer. He, I forget the numbers, but I think it was, was it 140, something like that? He's not Britain's most uh, mm. prolific serial killer. Amelia Dyer is. Yeah. She killed... 300 mm. babies. She's, she was a baby farmer and she killed 300 babies. There's an article in The Independent. And she was eventually, they began to realize that, you know, so what's going on? They kept finding all these children's bodies. What's going on? They, they, they couldn't accept that it was being done, you know, deliberately eventually until they had a, a royal inquiry and all these top physicians and detectives and so on started to investigate and they realized that it was actually having an effect on the on the on the uh, demographics you know the population you could see a dip in the population amongst the working class and it was because of these baby farmers not just in newcastle but across the country it was a huge scandal and yet nowadays 
Nobody knows Nobody about it. Nobody knows about it. it. No. And there were no teaching in school. It. It's probably the darkest, the darkest moment in our history as a nation. Yeah. And yet... And it's only 100 years ago. I mean... It's only 100 years ago. It's incredible, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what's the connection still between Henry, who was born in Dilston, where Josephine Elizabeth Butler lived and was an aristocratic mm. woman who saved prostitutes, and... Jane Scott. Well, I discovered that Jane Scott was uh, must have working out from what stage of pregnancy she was at. She must have been in Corbridge just at the time when Elizabeth and her husband George were. Now George was the vicar at St Andrew's Corbridge Church. And ordinarily, he would live down south, mm -hmm. but he was asked by the vicar of Corbridge Church, would would, would he do a, a, a few months stint there, and that would be her, that would be Jane's church. Yeah. So Jane, uh, Jane and her church, she's having a baby, she's lost, you know, she's got this terrible situation. Josephine Butler, whose business is and always has been rescuing destitute women, is in the same place at the same time. Mm -hmm. And where does Jane end up going to have her baby, Henry? In Dilston House, where Josephine Butler, her dad mm -hmm. lives. So that explains the link. Josephine Butler must have rescued yeah. my ancestor Jane. Yeah. That's how the story came yeah. about. This is uh, the church, so. lovely church at Corbridge, yeah. Corbridge St Andrew's Church, where Josephine uh, and uh, George particularly was the, um, the vicar. This is where they must have met because this is inside the church. George just for those few months, that little window was the vicar of this church, just at the time when Jane was in her desperate situation and uh, Jane must have connected with Josephine Butler and must have taken Jane to Dilston, to the posh mansion, and must have allowed her to, to stay there and be a housemaid or something similar. Yeah. Yeah. So there's the link. Henry, when he grew up, he moved to Bladen, uh, when he was 23, I think it was, and there's uh, there's the church in, in St Cuthbert's Church in Bladen, which plays an important part in the book. There's Bladen, a wonderful old photograph. A very pretty place. Mm -hmm. And in the book, Henry falls in love with Elizabeth Jane Ballans, who you saw on the family tree. She's seven years younger than him, so there's a bit of scandal about the fact that he's you know he's 23 and she's not. Mm -hmm. She's only barely 16. And you, they want to get married, but they can't because the father says, number one, she's too young. And number two, who are you, Henry Scott? We don't know anything about your mother. We don't know anything about your father. Yeah. So, you know, who is she marrying into? I'm sorry, son. It's not going to happen, basically, is what it amounts to. And so Henry needs to find out about his parents because he doesn't know himself. And the vicar of St Cuthbert's in Bladen takes up his, his, his problem and goes to Hexham. That's where he has the whiskey with the registrar and so on. And the story sort of unfolds like that. So yeah. it's all about Henry and Lizzie Jane and their love affair, uh, despite people prevent, trying to prevent yes. it. Love yes. will flourish, as you know. Uh, and also how they eventually managed to solve the problem of who Henry's parents were. So that's the idea behind the book. And it's, it's it, it uses yeah. all the old sort of accurate information like maps such as this. This is Hexham. Mm -hmm. We've just seen the, the Abbey there, Hexham Abbey. Yeah. The registry office is there. And um, the, the Railway Tavern at Hexham is a place close to my heart because I had to make quite a lot of trips up there in order to research <laughs> the book. And um, right. <laughs> what's called the Railway Tavern now is now, uh, then, is now the Station Inn. And it, it, it's, it's an original building surrounded by a lack of original building. So it just sits yeah. there like an island. Yeah. yeah. And they do bed, bed and breakfast for £36 a night. Which is, and it's a marvellous place. And um, the breakfast is to die for. Absolutely gorgeous, yeah. and it's just thirty-six pounds a night, which is just yeah, that's really very good. <laughs> so I stayed there on two separate occasions mm. while I was doing the research, and I had yeah. to write it into the book as well. 
because it's mm. such a great oh, yeah. place. You, yeah, you have to do, yes. Yeah. So it's in the book. This is the registrar's office as it looks now. Oh. Um, that's where, you know, um, the vicar discovers Jane's, uh, yeah. Henry's uh, birth record. And that's the same place as it looks now from the back. Mm. Uh, there's one of the chapters where the Reverend stays in the railway tavern, which you've just seen from the book. Um, this is where, just up from the railway tavern, a place called Hollow Meadows, there's an actual chapter called Hollow Meadows, and this is where yeah. it's based. Um, and now you can see it's a kitchen and bathroom place. Yeah. So it's all yeah. uh, accurately done. That's why yeah. that's yeah. proof that it's called yeah. Hollow Meadows. Yeah. This is back in Bladen, uh, in the uh, 60s, nice. this will be. That's a nice um, street. No, and it's, look how steep it is. I, I know, it's like, it's like that, I was going to say, it's a like a whole this, isn't it? Yes, it is like the Hobie's <laughs> advert, yeah. I walked <laughs> up that street, and it's in the book as well, Henry and Lizzie Jane walk up there. It's incredibly <laughs> steep, it's like really hard yeah. work. Um, so I, I needed Henry and Lizzie Jane to get together, and I knew from... The fact that they were living, that Lizzie Jane was living with her, I think it was seven daughter, uh, sisters. There's no way Henry and Lizzie Jane were going to get it together in, in Lizzie Jane's house because there were six mm -hmm. children and mum and dad in there. And, and like many um, con conceptions in those days, mm -hmm. they happened out, outdoors mm -hmm. because where else could you get together? Yeah. So I needed an outdoor venue for two crucial oh, scenes in the book. Um, and there's a place here which is known by the local Wynn Lake people as the Witch's Circle. Oh, it's, it's there. I was looking, I was there looking up at near the quarry. Yeah. I was thinking it was near the quarry at first. No, yeah. We're up in Wynn Lake now. Uh, the Witch's yeah. Circle is that little bunch of trees there. And mm. there used to be inside that bunch of trees a stone slab with a depression in the middle. And legend had it that witches used to do their sacrifices there. Yeah. And there are actually, if you go online, you can find them. There are legends about the witches of Wing Leighton. So I thought, well, that would be a really nice, interesting place to have them get together. Mm -hmm. So I, I used the venue. And my wife, I was looking around for a title of the book, and my wife said, what are you going to call the book? And I said, I was thinking of calling it Saving Henry. And she didn't <laughs> like that, really. And anyway, somebody else had used Saving Henry. So she said, why don't you call it Beyond the Witch's Circle? Because mm. she knew about the Witch's Circle. Mm. So I thought, hmm, I quite like that. So yeah. I used that. Somebody yeah. just got me into trouble because people, some people think it's going to be about witches, which it, it really well, isn't. You know. I, I must admit, when I first heard the title, I thought, I thought there were going to be witches in it as well. <laughs> they, they do get a mention, to be fair, but you know, it's, no, it's not about witches. It's not at all. Well, it's Beyond, um, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. This is a satellite photograph of that area. So you've got Wynn Leighton top left, uh, Wynn Leighton Mill bottom right. It's, it's a hill that goes down from Wynn Leighton to Wynn Leighton Mill, going downhill. And there's the Witch's Circle. Mm. And if you if you look carefully, you can see that diagonal path there. Yeah. That's still there. And I've walked down it. And what you do is you walk down that. It's, it's just a very faint path. You walk across here, you go over a gate there, and then you're into the field that contains the witch's circle and that is believe it or not that is the witch's circle That's i it. had to trip i had to yeah. trespass to take that photograph so i, I <laughs> kept my eyes open for the farmer because apparently the farmers get really not when people go and try and you know go and are, the horses, are the horses or cows i can i see a cow in the background as well you uh, a field of cows yes as well. there are cows yeah <laughs> and inside and inside the the witch's circle itself there are indeed horses so this was taken inside the witch's circle and there yeah. used to be this stone slab on the ground with mm -hmm. a depression in the middle a stone of sacrifice but it, mm -hmm. the farmer got so annoyed with people coming to see it and use it you know yeah pagan stuff yeah yeah he, took it, he had it taken away <laughs> <It's it off. laughs> I'd, I'd love to have that in my garden actually i really would Oh, that'd be your next Unfortunately, it, it's, I don't know where it, I don't know where it's gone. So that's why it's called Beyond the Witch's Circle. It's amazing. Uh, it's a love story. It's about social history. It's mm. about shocking revelations about what happened in Victorian times. Mm. That's what it's about. This is um, later on in the book. 
Lizzie Jane decides that she must tell Henry that she's, she's pregnant. Yeah. And she does so on that bridge there, which is the bridge over the railway at Bladen, just near Bladen Station. So that's a scene, a very important scene in the book yeah. where yeah. Lizzie Jane tells Henry in the boring rain that he's, he's going to be a father. And that, of course, is really bad news because neither of you know they're not married. Um, it's like history is repeating itself. Yeah. You know, Henry was Henry's mum was in a similar situation, mm -hmm. and they're determined not to let the same thing happen to them, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, right at the end of the book, they end up in a in a pub, as we would now call it, called the New Inn, uh, and this pub is a real place, and there it is in in Bladen, yeah. uh, the New Inn. And uh, it all reaches its, the story reaches its climax in that, in that pub. And there is the new inn, there's actual people outside it, actual yeah. shots, a photograph of the new inn, yeah. uh, just at the turn of the century. Yeah. And that's a, a little extract from the very end of the book, as you can see, set in the new inn. And the reason I put that there is to get across this idea that it, throughout the book, every Every person, apart from three people, every place, everything mm. is real. Mm. That's why I call it a historical novel. And that and must have been very difficult to write and, and oh have my goodness. information in. If I, you're making it up, it's so much easier, yeah. I assume. I mean, mm. obviously, I don't know the words that were said, so I had to make up the dialogue. Yeah. You know, because I haven't got that, unless it's written down like it in those books I showed you. But, yeah. you know, the dialogue between Henry and Lizzie Jane and whether she told him mm. on that bridge or not, I don't mm. know. But that bridge exists. Mm. And she must have told him at some point. You know, mm. So that's how it is. I, I, I sort of think of it as like um, a, a, a framework of historical facts, yeah. thousands of historical reliable facts around which I filled in the gaps with, with, with story, you know. Mm. That's how, yeah. it, that's how it works. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's called Beyond the Witcher Circle. And uh, I've had a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, fun with it. I've had I've sold quite a few books. And also I've got quite a following up in the northeast uh, in Geordie land, where I'm an honorary Geordie almost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, because, it's, because it's written where, where they live. Yeah, you've I got something to life for them, haven't you? Yeah, yeah pretty yeah. popular. If, if people want to, if people want to get the book, uh, the best place to get it from is from Horwich, from uh, Sue Wright's shop, which is the Wright Reads on yes. Winter Hay Lane. Yeah. Uh, just halfway down Winter Hay Lane, when it opens at the end of the uh, lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the best place to get it from, and also there's my other book, uh, The King Cried for Coventry, which I mentioned earlier. But you can also get it online just by the, the easiest way to be honest is just by putting putting beyond the witcher circle into yeah. google and it just pops up but you mm. can also put bit.ly lowercase forward yeah. slash win late with a cap, yeah. capital w yeah and that takes you to the page where it's available you can get it as a kindle which only costs a, a couple of pounds mm. two pounds i think something like that mm -hmm. or as a paperback which is obviously a bit more yes yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, if people want to buy it, that'd be great. Do you know, so, Matt, that, that was really, really interesting. Honestly, it was amazing. I feel like I've watched an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? It's absolutely <laughs> fantastic, but, but better, a lot better. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because <laughs> I mean, it certainly kept me out of mischief yeah. while you know, researching it. I must say. I mean, the, the writing, history side of it is fantastic. Yeah. I'm writing a sequel now, but I'm, I'm a bit stuck with it. <laughs> oh. So I, I, I will I will finish it, but it might take me a few years. It took me two years to write this one, and re write and research it, and yeah. I'm, I'm I'm about a year into the second one. So, well, it's having it's I suppose it's it's having all that fantastic family of history and then pulling it all together, mm. and and then and then obviously needing the knowledge of the area as well. There's a lot of work involved, isn't there, to then write it and make it, you know, like you say, true to life. To, to get the dates to to lock together, because of course if I'm sticking to the accurate dates, yeah. and I can't just make them up. Yeah. I had to use a massive spreadsheet working out, because the, the story takes place over different times, I had to work yeah. out how old people were at the different times and all the rest of it. You know. yeah. And was it possible that they could ever do that? You know, 
because mm. you can't have you can't have people meeting after one of them's died. This kind of thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So it was it was tricky to get it all to knit together, but I managed it in the end. Yeah. And I suppose you don't want your characters to die, do you? <laughs> you, know, it's, you? You don't want to have to start with somebody new either, really. No, you know? and I'm, not, I'm saying nothing about whether that happens or not. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, is it a happy ending? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So do you need to do some more trips over there for your second book? For, well, for the, I think for the second, second book, yeah. I'm, I'm allowing myself a little bit more license. I'm still sticking to a background of facts, but I'm reading a bit more of the narrative into it so at the moment i probably don't need to drop there but we'll yeah. see depends how yeah. the book what i am using is the is all the stuff you can get it online like the newspapers from the time i, I take stories from the newspaper mm. at, at, the, at the time and see if there's anything that might be interesting that i could weave into yes. the story so that's then if people idea. say oh yeah that's yeah. too far-fetched yeah. that could never happen i can say well yes it did actually because here's the newspaper article that I took the idea from, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think people, um, you know, we've got our short story competition going, and, and obviously 500 words is nothing compared to what, what you've written in your, in your book. But people still always want to know where to get ideas from. I mean, you've given, as well as all the fantastic, you know, history and so on behind your book, you've given lots of ideas to people who might want to just pull, pull something short out to write about, you know. Mm -hmm. Because everybody will have something in the family history that they could they could write a very short. Definitely, you know, yeah. Paragraphs. And there are so many fantastic Pages sources. About. Yeah, there's so yeah. many. I mean, obviously, there's the um, there's the genealogical websites I use massively. Yeah. Ancestry, Find My Past, Family mm -hmm. Search, and, and yeah. they you know they will give you not just who you know who was born when and what mm -hmm. they did, which is important, but yeah. also there's you know documents like. Um, for example, if somebody's admitted to the workhouse, there's always a page of, of, of you know, information about their background and why they've had to come to the workhouse. Yeah. Well, that's like gold dust, you know. Mm. Uh, and also, it's unique, isn't it? You know, it's not like it you're is. just duplicating stories that, you know, are always yeah. the same books, same stories, aren't they? You've yeah. got something completely different. And yeah. the maps, I mean, are fantastic online maps. I use the ones from the National Library of Scotland. Um, and you get maps, you know. I'm going to write that down. That's handy yeah. to know. <laughs> it's, no, it's just brilliant. I mean, if, if you you know if you're interested in where you live or where your parents, mm. just go to the National Library of Scotland, mapping it, the mapping part of it. You can bring up old maps of where wherever you want in the country. Wow, well, I didn't know. Uh, that. From Victorian times, doesn't cost anything. Yeah. You know, it's free, um, mm. and you could really lose yourself in those. I bet. I bet. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I use those massive. Oh, you, you saw, you know, mm. um, and all well, books. I, I was thinking as I was looking at them because my I've got in fact like a really nice family history story, and it's the maps that I don't have. And I'm thinking, where's he got those maps from? <laughs> no, oh, well, yeah, I mean, after this, you know, if you get stuck, you can't find it, just give, give me an email, I'll, uh, I'll put yeah. you onto it. I might have uh, to once get you, once you start, book. you won't stop, believe me. <laughs> Because you can't leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Oh, well, it's been really, really good of you today, Mark, to um, give us all of that that free lecture for a start. It's been absolutely fantastic and all the information as well. And and your efforts. I mean, I was enthralled all the way through, you know. I don't know how long we've been talking, but, it, <laughs> you know, I've just been really interested all the way through. It, it was. It was fantastic. So Smash thank it. you very thank much. You. Thank you. So if people, yeah, so if, I'll, I'll stop recording in a second. If people want to get hold of the book, they can Google or they can go to the shop in Horwich. Or like you said, it's available on Amazon and Kindle. So hopefully we'll get some good feedback about the book as well. And uh, it'd be nice, yeah. it's nice to know what other people think about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't really want to make money out of it. I just want people to read it, actually. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. all I really want, you know, and it pleases me when people read it. And especially if they like it, which most yes. people seem to, so that's yeah. good. But we have a family history group at um, our centre in Falmouth who uh, they really like, obviously, like any, anybody that's researching the family history is really involved, you know, and really into it. So I'm hoping that they'll be able to watch this and, and you know, enjoy it as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. There'll be lots and if you know any other groups that, you know, are interested in this mm -hmm. kind of thing, I'm happy to do what we've just done um, again. You yeah, know, that's lots good to know. Group. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, thank you. I'll start recording and just uh, say goodbye okay. to you properly. <laughs>
<laughs> without recording it. Thank you so much. Thank you.